Hi, I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. Every episode, we explore death, dying, and grief through stories by authors familiar with the topic. Writers are our translators. They take what is inexpressible, impossible to explain, and they translate it into words on a page. Today, we're talking with architect and writer Adam Robarts. Adam was born in London and raised in Uganda and Kenya. He and his wife, Karen, moved to China in the 90s, where they raised their four children, including their son, Hayden, who passed away from a brain tumor at just 19 years old. Adam's book, 19, is a beautiful book about Hayden, how he lived, about Adam's experience losing a son. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. And uh, it's really an honor to be on your podcast for Peaceful Exit. Before we talk about Hayden, I understand your father died before you learned of Hayden's illness. It, it takes a really unique and conscious individual to be with the dying. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about what it was to hospice your own father. In 2013, February, my father passed away in his very humble home in Kampala, Uganda. My father had pancreatic cancer. Uh, He was losing a lot of weight, and it was obvious that he was now in that last chapter of his life, preparing to graduate from this life. And Thank goodness for morphine to help manage the the pain. And he had a hospice nurse, and this nurse would come and administer the morphine. And everything else was left to us, you know, sitting on the side of dad's bed with him and saying prayers, meditating and reflecting and just being present for him and with him. He didn't say much in those last days, but he was still conscious And um, I had the great honor to be with dad as he took his last breaths. And interestingly, after dad passed away, I thought, my goodness, now I've got to figure out how we're going to do the burial and how do we wash his body and prepare his body and how do we find a coffin and all these very practical things that I had to figure out. I was a little bit lost in that moment and I noticed on dad's bookshelf, a binder that said my graduation. And I thought, that's interesting. What's that about? And I pulled it off his shelf. Literally, this is within hours of dad's passing. I'd never even noticed it on his shelf. And I opened it up and my goodness, it was his instructions for his burial. And thank goodness I found it, you know, (laughs) rather than two or three weeks later when it might have been too late. And I opened it and it was literally like instructions for the preparation of a party. That's fantastic. He said people should be dancing at my funeral. And I thought, oh my, how am I going to get people to dance at dad's funeral? And then there was something he wrote in capital letters and underlined it several times. He said, Africans don't die. They rise to greatness. And I I just thought, Dad, you are something else. You know, you just have this complete fearlessness. I just love that he had a binder with instructions in it because it's exactly what we talk about in Peaceful Exit is making sure you articulate your wishes so that, that you who are left behind are not wondering. And that if you had dancing at his his memorial that he you know that he's you know smiling on the other side you know yeah. that he's happy that you provided exactly what he wanted at the at the end and uh did this impact how you talked to Hayden about death yes yes actually it is interesting that Hayden left a will and this is what it said right at the very top live a life filled with joy, and try to consciously consider how to bring joy to the lives of those around you as well. Wise words. So tell me a little bit about Hayden. So Hayden was one of four children. He was a normally healthy 19-year-old with a 
a seemingly bright future ahead of him. He was about to go to University College London to study architecture, which he was greatly looking forward to. And I was so excited. I always thought, well, one of, one of our children has, <laughs> has taken to, to architecture as a calling. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he, in a course of about two weeks, he started to feel progressively worse. He had some nausea and headaches. His eyesight was getting a little bit more blurred. And so at the advice of my brother, who's an ER doctor in Toronto, Hayden got on the train and went from Ottawa to Toronto, where he then had an MRI just to be safe. And the MRI of his brain showed a tumor right in the midbrain next to the pituitary gland. So this began a nine and a half month journey through cancer that involved brain surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation. And in March of 2020, Hayden was informed by the doctors that really it was unlikely he would be able to survive. When did you start talking to Hayden about the possibility of him not surviving this? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important as parents that we don't leave it to that late. And I think talking to Hayden about death from his earliest years, Hayden was 13 when his grandfather passed away. And when I came back from dad's funeral in Uganda, I didn't hide anything. So our kids got that from their very earliest age. And actually, even a few years later, I, I mention in the book, sort of almost like in a footnote, that Hayden as a young boy in 2008, he buried Zanda Ali, our youngest, who never actually lived in this world because he didn't quite make it to full term. And so we lost a child and we knew it was a boy and we had a name for him. And Hayden had a love for his younger brother who he never got to meet. But he decided with Talis and Cyan that they wanted to help dig the grave, that we would bury this little casket. Again, that's a very powerful experience of death, you know, as an eight-year-old. Well, it's truly exceptional, I want to say. Yeah. Truly exceptional. And visited it. Hayden visited it more than any of the others, more than any of us. And Hayden would plant Sibuliao flowers around this little graveside for Zander Ali. Whether it was his grandfather or his younger brother, or actually Karen's father as well passed away, and Hayden would have been very conscious of that. So we definitely had, with our children, opportunities for them to reflect on death, to talk about death, to come to terms with death, to see it as something that happens to all of us. You know, nobody gets yeah. out of here alive. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to realize that actually it's part of our eternal journey. And um, so now we go to the question you asked, which is that, okay, Hayden has been diagnosed with cancer. And I think for anybody, even hearing the word cancer, hard to completely not associate it with death. There's always that tinge that sense, oh my goodness, this is cancer. And many people do die of cancer. And of course, it would have occurred to Hayden. We didn't even need to raise it. We didn't need to mention it. He knew it. He knew that was a possibility. Whatever was to be the outcome, he accepted it with grace and gratitude. And he knew from the very beginning that if he was going to die of this cancer, well, that was... That was one option. And not that that was his choice. Definitely not. He wanted to live. He wanted to live a long and fantastic life. And even, you know, when we were presented with this kind of verdict, you know, that actually the cancer had spread and that we had come to the end of the curative path, Hayden said, I wonder if we could look for a clinical trial. You know, let's see if we have, let's not leave any stone unturned. He was a 19 year old. He wasn't giving up. And we found this extraordinary clinical trial in New York. And the percentage survival for the type of tumor that he had was low. It was about 7%. And Hayden said, even if it's 1%, that's better than nothing. Yeah. You know, how extraordinary. He saw it as positive, you know, <laughs> instead of complaining, why is it only 7%? He said, that's okay. That's, you know, even if it's 1%, that's better than nothing. So he was... He was going for it. He wanted to do everything he could. And then if the result of that was that 
the will of God, the nature of what we know of science at this time about these particular kind of tumors means that we don't survive? Well, that's the result, and we accept it. One of the things I love in your book is Hayden's peacemaking, specifically keeping the peace amongst his siblings. He had a lovely, calming presence, Hayden did. Um, I think sometimes these days we often refer to it as a condition of mindfulness. Um, but actually, you refer to a, a vignette, how when we were in Toronto, there was sometimes tensions in the space. And at that time, we didn't know Hayden was going to pass away. We were absolutely, you know, on this journey of chemotherapy and radiation where we fully expected he would be, he would be cured. And then, so occasionally there was tension and Hayden would say, Cyan and Keon, why don't you just come into my room for a few minutes? <laughs> and he would close the door and, you know, 20 minutes later, the door would open and there'd be a peace treaty in place. You know, that they would just have found reconciliation. How did you and Karen, as parents, as spouses, hold each other up? You know, Karen and I parents of these four children in this apartment and parents of Hayden going through his cancer treatments, going back and forth to the hospital all the time. And sometimes as an inpatient, we'd be dealing with having to be at the hospital, sometimes overnight, accompanying Hayden through these difficult nights during chemotherapy. And uh, it wasn't easy for us. There were tensions. You know, I think I, I overstepped my place and trying to get everything right and trying to micromanage. And I, I wish I had done that differently. I wish I had been more able to breathe and accept and be calmer and less controlling as a parent. Um, once Karen said to me as I grabbed my backpack, full of Hayden's notes and his urinal and the medications and every eventuality that could happen on the journey between our apartment and the hospital, had all the meds and the kit and everything that he might possibly need. And Karen would say to me, it looks like you're going to a NASA mission. You know, you're just so prepped and so ready. Just take a breath. And I'm so grateful that she did that sometimes and Hayden did that sometimes to remind me we have to trust that it's not only my will that is controlling the show, but there is a greater will. Do you feel like, though, as a father, mm -hmm. there's some instinct around protection, around taking care? Sure. It is, and it's healthy, but you know, it can be... I feel like I need Overly. to give you a little grace no. right here because you're Thank such, you. <laughs> you're judgmental <laughs> well, about I, I, I mean, these are some things where I look back and I think, what could I have done differently? And, you know, I am, I describe myself in the book as a Hayden's climbing companion in this sort of metaphor of accompanying him up this mountain. And of course, it wasn't just me. We were a climb team and the family were part of the climb team, the doctors, the medics. And I'm the kind of, I realized on this journey that as a climbing companion, it was my instinct, if I could, because of my love for Hayden, if he'd let me, I'd have just picked him up and put him on my shoulders and climbed right. to the summit. That's but right. you know, then, then one has to ask the question, well, are you letting him become the mountaineer in this journey? If actually you just pick him up and carry him. You know, I, I think you actually can deprive people of journeying their journey, summiting their mountains. And I think it's in my nature to be maybe because of love, absolutely because of love, you know, wanting to control, to manage, to make sure that Hayden could do this as painlessly as possible, that I sometimes didn't let go and trust that he had this. We had this as a team. Hayden's last few weeks were spent with your family in a lakeside cabin north of Ottawa. How was that last week prior to his passing? To give this context, let's remember this was 2020, COVID. In New York, you know, Hayden is a patient going into hospitals that were sort of beginning to get their heads around how to deal with COVID. And now we had 
as a family come across the border to have these last weeks with Hayden. And there were tests and difficulties. And we didn't have the nurses because they were not allowed to come to the home. We were in quarantine. And how do we do hospice on Zoom? And having to give subcutaneous injections to my son, I really, who bringing it back now as a memory and as an experience. And I am reminded that Karen had a determination to make whatever time we had beautiful. And even though this was midwinter, even though this was a time of COVID raging, <laughs> she wanted fresh flowers in the room with Hayden. She wanted calm in our room so that there was peacefulness for him and he could rest. Did he like music? Did you play he any music? He did. He loved music. And Karen wanted to make sure that that was possible. So if the sound of making lunch in the kitchen was pans rattling and she wanted to make sure that we washed up the pans and we made food without making too much noise and trying to make sure that we honored this time with Hayden in that room. And there was always a chair or two beside the bed so that maybe Keon could sit beside him and massage his feet you know, sometimes for hours at a time. Kian, God bless him, spent hours either just massaging Hayden's feet or saying prayers beside his bed, you know, when Hayden was often too weak to speak. And sometimes as a family, we would gather around. Were you all with him in the moment of his death? In those last few days, we were always present. So there was always one family member, at least, beside his bed. Through the night, we would take turns, and we had had we'd had a, a, a sort of a little bit of a difficult night. Karen and I had tried to get a little bit of sleep. We knew we were very close to the end. You yeah. can tell that sometimes from the breathing. Absolutely. And um, Keon, Hayden's younger brother, took his turn to be by Hayden's bedside, so Karen and I could get a coffee. It was close to nine thirty in the morning, and Keon said, "Mom and Dad, I think you might want to come." And we came over and Karen put her hand on Hayden's heart and I held his hand and we stood beside his bed with Keon. Keon actually went and got the other two and Hayden took his last breaths right there in the context of our family home surrounded by us and knowing how much he was loved and out and out and out those last three deep out breaths. And then his heart stilled, and we knew he had moved on to whatever lies beyond that veil, that mysterious afterwards. We gathered, and just nobody said anything. We just were present for however many minutes it was, just all of us standing in silence around our beloved Hayden. And then I, I gathered the strength to say a prayer for the departed. Were you able to take care of his body? Yes. Would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. This is not something we talk about much in the Western world. That's right. In the laws of Baha'i burial, there is some, there are a few things that are mentioned. So we tried to honor those. One is that the body should be washed and wrapped, if possible, in, in silk. So Karen had, for example, bought some sponges that were sea sponges, natural sponges, so we could each wash a part of his body. So Keon, who had spent all those hours massaging his older brother's feet, oh. he was in charge of washing Hayden's feet, and I uh, washed his chest and in a very sacred and as much a dignified way, respectful way, we prepared his body and then wrapped it um, in some silk that we had bought, some simple white silk from China. And Karen had a little bit of uh, attar of rose, right? rose water, that we could then just anoint his body. It just there's a beautiful fragrance of rose in the room. And so here we were, because of COVID, the funeral home we had arranged with them that they would bring the coffin to us. And as we took the coffin out of the house, we sang Baha'i prayer. 
Um, and then, my goodness, we weren't expecting it in the garden, keeping a social distancing that was possible. All these people were gathered. My goodness, there were friends who had heard that Hayden had passed and they wanted to come and pay their respects. So, yeah, those were very, very special moments as a family to still be with Hayden, to honor him, to feel his presence. Absolutely. Um, and in no way was this the end. I think this is something really important. I think when we see death as the end, it can really grip us with fear, paralyze us, and actually prevent us from appreciating that sacred time that we're in and that sacred space. The closest we have, I think, is birthing. You know, 20 years earlier, I had been at Hayden's birth. I watched him come from that world of the womb into this world. It was kind of like I was attending, I was waiting at the arrival gate to see my beloved son being born. And I, I was just aghast. I was, even though I'd watched this once before with his older brother, I just felt awestruck at the the extraordinariness of this process um, as a father attending the birth of his son. And here I was now, 20 years later, not at the arrivals gate, but at the departure gate, you know, saying goodbye to him. And um, as my wife Karen often says, it wasn't that he was going. He was just going ahead. It's been just over two years since Hayden's graduation. How would you say your relationship with him has evolved? First of all, I miss him terribly. It would be naive and inaccurate to say otherwise. You know, I miss hugging him in the mornings. I miss, you know, being able to talk to him about architecture. I miss his wisdom in our family consultations. <laughs> Um, his and peacemaking. <laughs> his peacemaking, for sure. You know, what a gift he was to our family. I do miss him terribly, and grieving is real. And I have been grieving, for sure. We all have as a family. All of us in our own ways. And I have felt the pain of losing him. What an incredible journey for you and your family. And as challenging and painful as it was, you were all, especially Hayden, very thoughtful in how you approached it. We had prepared ourselves. We knew what was going to happen. I think, Sarah, you mentioned earlier about with peaceful exiting, it is greatly helpful to a family, especially to prepare, to write a will, to reflect on what we wish um, when we take those last moments, what we want to have as the context and what we want to have in the moments and hours and days afterwards, how we want our funerals to be. If we can be quite specific about that, it's a tremendous gift to our families because then we, we are not suddenly caught both grieving and needing to prepare um, for something as momentous as a funeral and gathering family and friends and and try doing funerals during COVID, that's not easy. And, you know, restrictions that there were or number of attendees. And so we had actually thought through all of those things before. And in that last week, Karen described once how she was ironing our clothes for the funeral while other parents were preparing their 19-year-olds for university and, you know, getting clothes and sheets ready for their bedsits in university accommodation. <laughs> and here she was ironing clothes for our funeral, you know, with, for Hayden's funeral. It was very surreal, but actually very special that we had that chance to prepare, you know, so it was conscious. Thank you for the gift of your time and your story. I certainly hope people will read your book. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Peaceful Exit. You can learn more about this podcast and my online course at my website, peacefulexit.net. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know. You can rate and review this show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. This episode was produced by Large Media. You can find them at larjmedia.com. 
Special thanks to Ricardo Russell for the original music throughout this podcast. More of his music can be found on Bandcamp. As always, thanks for listening. I'm Sarah Kavanaugh, and this is Peaceful Exit. <laughs>